Thanks for having us here today. Good afternoon. As, as just mentioned, my name is Eileen Su. Um, I also just wanted to acknowledge uh, the people of the Kulin Nation, which is the land that I gather on uh, today here at Monash University. Um, I want to pay my respects to the elders past, present uh, and emerging. Claire? Uh, thank you, Eileen. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, ko ingarangi te whakapapa rangamai, enari uh, ki oriwa o i noho ana. Uh, ko Thank you for the very lovely welcome, uh, Jess, and, and for being here today. Great. Thanks. Yes, Claire said, thanks for having us here today. Claire and I are really excited to be talking about an initiative called the Macro View, as alluded to in the title and in Jess's um, introduction, uh, which we're coordinating across Australia and Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, but before I get, we jump into the Macro View and some of the work that we've already started on it, I wanted to walk everyone through the research data culture conversation, um, which was really the beginning of the Macro View and which generated the ideas that got us to this um, project. So. Uh, just right. Uh, so the research charter culture conversation is an initiative of five of Australia's uh, research intensive universities and welcoming New Zealand in two more recently, um, who who gathered together a couple, uh, five years or so ago because they acknowledged the fact that they felt the pain. Um, of having to manage a growing corpus of digital research content. Um, and in particular, what was important about that conversation was the realization that uh, institutions were the primary location where data ambitions and obligations were meeting budgets. Um, and to be able to effectively and efficiently manage this, um, a, a nationally coherent discipline sensitive response needed to be defined. And what this meant was that the nature of research meant that institutions couldn't confront these challenges on their own. So they couldn't get to an effective research data management culture in isolation. And that's for a number of reasons. And some of the reasons identified through the RDCC discussions were that um, this is because an efficient treatment of data depended on information and metadata that wasn't readily available. Um, it was also not systematically available. Um, that the research data challenges stand interest and activities traditionally owned by multiple research support pillars such as the library um, and IT. Um, and that efficiencies and economies of scale for these quality improvements required the coordinated effort um, with these different pillars. So you can see here that uh, the RDCC universities at the moment are these five Australian universities and uh, Claire uh, with Nessie have also been represented more recently. But in each of these different universities, there are varying groups that participate in conversations. We have representatives across infrastructure as well as uh, library governance and policy. So, so just to unpack this little, these three uh, dot points a little further, uh, when we were talking about the, the availability of metadata, uh, a lot of it came down to what was where the appropriate involvement of researchers were during that kind of process. And so there were two key um, concepts and ideas that arose from this discussion. Firstly, that RDMPs as they currently are developed do not provide the relative information that informs decision making across a research lifestyle. And, and this is for many reasons, um, such as that they're a static point in time capture of information available, um, and that they're often left uh, to the researchers to decide what's adequate and whatever they understand as best practice, they'll put into that, that data management plan. And so we theorize that a, a research data management plan 2.0, that would help inform us on making decisions about our digital content and our digital data uh, would need to be service build oriented, need to support decision making. So need to understand what are the decisions we need to make throughout a research project life cycle and make, enable those decisions to be made in an automated fashion. If this, uh, if research data was growing, uh, then the, you, we can expect that the decisions we need to make is also going to exponentially grow as well. Uh, the second idea that we came across was that uh, research data life cycles don't ad adequately capture or reflect the research in practice um, and that the focus on decision points would provide a more enriched and detailed perspective of what information we did need and what metadata would be useful in trying to make decisions um, to, to effectively manage our research data. Uh, so the other challenge was, as mentioned, that uh, interests and activities traditionally span multiple pillars, so library records, archive, IT functions, um, and e-research functions. And this, how, how we conveyed this holistic kind of view we needed to take was through the yin and yang of data. 
So to be able to effectively and efficiently manage mission research data, sharing, uh, preservation and reuse, the yin of data, which has traditionally been the focus of many conversations, needs to be balanced against the yang of data. So resourcing, sensitivity and, and end of life. And this holistic perspective requires all the pillars of a university to be able to participate, um, to share and understand what the responsibilities are within each of these different decision points. Um, so we, we need to recognize that the, the data management problem is not related to one particular activity such as sharing. We need to consider uh, the other responsibilities of other areas of the university as well. Uh, finally, uh, so uh, institutions will become the large scale, will invest in large scale infrastructure to achieve the efficiencies required in managing a growing corpus of digital content. And this is the start of the macro review. So this is what um, got us started on trying to um, capture an at scale view of Australian and Aotearoa New Zealand's um, research data. So at the, so in 2021, uh, the participating RDCC universities at the time decided to try to understand what was the scale and what was the scale of the problem that they were collectively collectively trying to manage. So you can see here in 2022, so we redid these numbers, um, this year with a 2022 capture, the five universities of the RDCC are holding 85,000 petabytes or 85,000 85, terabytes or 85 petabytes of research content. And this is growing at about 24% as of last year. And so this might be a bit of a scary picture, but it goes to show that why the solutions required moving forward require a coordinated response across universities as well as across the sector uh, because the problem at scale um, the problem is at scale and therefore the solutions also need to take into account what are the boundaries of that challenge what is the scale of it so to that effect uh, we decided uh, last year to see whether we would be able to expand the view of the challenge um, and then get a better estimate on the scale of which this challenge Australia might be facing and so we expanded the macro view uh, to be for the whole of Australia. Um, so this is where we start talking about the Australian macro view and the activity that took place and some of the findings that we have. So the Australian macro view of research data was uh, trying to find out how much future access, uh, how much research data held in managed services by research organisations existed. Um, and so we went out to universities, uh, the Medical Research Institute, CSIRO and the National Research Infrastructures with four what we thought was simple questions um, at the time. And so the four questions were um, for sample points in 2019, 2020, 2021, um, how much first copy unique data held for future access in enterprise scale and managed data services existed at your institution or your organization, sorry. Um, how much total storage of volume did you need to be able to support that corpus of data? Uh, what was the volume uh, in open, that was openly accessible? Um, and what was the volume in managed services promoted as suitable for ethics and privacy sensitive requirements. So we had already got an understanding that the emerging kind of conversation of sensitive data and sensitive classification meant that we might not be able to directly pinpoint um, data sets or data that was sensitive. So hence we just moved towards a more general uh, proxy measure for that. Uh, we do acknowledge that there are, there is research data held in other organisations such as in government agencies, um, the BOM, Geoscience Australia, but we really wanted to focus on these um, organisations to begin with. So during the course of last year, uh, we reached out to over 60 uh, research organisations. The list is here, as you can see. Um, so we had, and every time we met with these organisations, we were met with great enthusiasm to participate and a real interest to try to figure out, well, what was the answer to this uh, very new and exciting question about how much research data was in Australia. Uh, but what we also realised um, from these conversations was no matter how enthusiastic someone was, it proved to be impossible to answer these questions. So this is for a number of reasons. 
um, but mainly because research data as an asset, so the data assets were not identified within the broader corpus of digital content, as well as that internal reporting on research data volumes and research data related metrics um, didn't exist beforehand, um, either in a regular or an ad hoc fashion. So it did take some work to try to understand, well, what are the metrics we would want to measure about our research data that would be useful and help inform our future decision making. So because of these difficulties, uh, on the fly, we decided that we would um, change our questions to reflect a better, um, to reflect the practice and to reflect our current understanding. So a few of the changes we had to make um, to our questions was instead of asking what was the first copy of unique uh, research data, uh, we had to change to the first copy of digital content. And this came, that comes down to our research organizations are not able to distinguish routine research data and other research related content. Um, as well as this total storage volumes were too difficult to measure. So we have very little data points related to the total amount of storage an organization needs to support their research ambitions. Um, we also had to change from openly accessible to openly discoverable. Uh, so at, through the process of this, we started to understand that um, there are different mechanisms um, of access to something that is discoverable. So openly discoverable, and also importantly, uh, openly discoverable and mainly in institutional repositories. So anything that an institution could see, uh, we weren't able to access international repositories. And finally, we didn't need to make any changes to the sensitivity uh, metric. Um, so we took these four questions and we only asked for a data point in December 2021. Um, and these were the results. Uh, so what you can see here is that uh, the light blue line is the actual reported. So not every in research organization was able to provide a number, even if we did go back and forth on, uh, and, and engaged in a discussion. So the light blue is the actuals that was reported and the dark blue line is our estimate for the sector based on extrapolation factors, which I'll explain a bit later. So as you can see, our first ever number, which is quite exciting, is in 2021, uh, we estimate that Australia had almost 300 petabytes of research content, importantly content and not data at this point. So just to break down a little bit more about some of the findings based on those four questions. So we estimated that there's 300 petabytes of, of research content across Australian research organisations. Um, and we extrapolated based on research intensity factors. So for universities, we use block grants and for medical research institutes, FTE of researchers. Uh, of, so institutions hold the bulk of the, of the digital content in Australia. So 72% of the total estimate comes from institutions and seven of the 10 top contributors. So those who could actually report were um, inst research institutions, which is uh, universities, the medical research institutes or CSIRO. What we also found was that 85 petabytes of content was discoverable, uh, was openly discoverable. And the majority of that 72 petabytes is from astronomy or reference data sets. Uh, the rest of it comes from institutional repositories. Uh, we also discovered that 32 petabytes of content was reported to be held in assistance uh, approved for sensitive data uh, and medical research institutes contribute 60% of that overall reported content. Finally, uh, discipline specific reporting is not possible. So the only exception is with astronomy, uh, which reported was able to report 53, 53 petabytes of research data across Australia. And this is largely because of the nature of their work, uh, their research um, and their established practices in this space. Uh, but we weren't able to report any other discipline specific metrics. Uh, so on that, I will pass over to Claire. Thank you, Alan. So I think we wanted to um, utilize uh, and learn from, um, from what our Australian colleagues had done and, and we're sort of much newer to this uh, conversation. Um, but I guess if we go to the next slide, I think we wanted to be consistent as possible in terms of what um, questions we were asking so that we could be comparable. Um, but equally, we kind of needed to make sure that we were, uh, it was appropriate for sort of an Aotearoa context. Um, and so our sort of our first um, iteration of this was to add a question um, about Maori data sovereignty, um, specifically asking about the volume of unique data that has Maori kaitiakitanga or, or guardianship, so some, some level of Maori governance over it. Um, 
And uh, this is obviously uh, very important in New Zealand from a tertiary uh, of Waitangi, the, the Treaty of Waitangi perspective, um, uh, to ensure that. So we, uh, like our Australian counterparts, looked across universities, uh, the CRIs and national infrastructure. Um, but we did start quite small um, when we first did this. Um, so if your institution is not yet a part of this conversation, then, then we're keen to reach out to do sort of a next iteration. Uh, so if we just go to the next slide. So we wanted, um, because we couldn't sample everyone, um, we wanted to be able to do some predictions. Um, so we based this on research budget. So these are sort of um, grant funding summaries from MV um, and the three institutes uh, that we worked with, Ag Research, Manaki Whenua and uh, Waipapa Tomatoro, uh, the University of Auckland, were all, um, I, I guess, together combined make about 38% of the, um, the research funding. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, so we had a we had an attempt at answering answering these questions, um, and I guess Nessie uh, worked alongside uh, because we hold quite a lot of data on behalf of institutions with New Zealand. Um, we had to go at answering the questions, um, and I guess like the first time this was done in Australia, uh, a lot of the questions couldn't be answered with any kind of accuracy, so we didn't really get a real number. Um, for any of first copy open access sensitive data or kind of Maori data with Kaitiaki Tanga. Um, everyone managed to have an attempt at, at total volume. Um, and so of the, um, I guess, together four, four institutes that we looked at, um, there were 13 petabytes um, of research data. Um, and I've separated out Nessie just because we wanted to then extrapolate um, to the sort of, to look at a, a sector wide um, view of New Zealand um, but obviously, sort of, there is no scaling of Nessie. So we kept those separate for the scaling. Um, and based on research um, funding, we estimate around sort of 21%, um, or 21 petabytes, sorry, uh, when we're at 100% of that, of that scaling, 21 petabytes uh, within the country. Um, now, as we heard yesterday about the inaccuracy of facts, so take these take take these numbers with a grain of salt I think at this point um we also took and had another approach of scaling down from Australia because I think um their numbers with sort of the last review are much more accurate so we thought well if we can scale down um from those numbers to sort of a, a New Zealand size fit and um, what does that look like um and that's a much bigger number so that's that's 49 petabytes uh and now there's the question of well which of our models is wrong or are they both wrong potentially? Um, so we used GDP um, as a way of scaling down. Uh, so I guess the first the first uh, explanation to explain that big gap um, is that probably GDP is possibly not a good measure. Um, so we're currently working out what what might be a better measure. Um, but I think also there's potential reasons um, such as the sort of the difference in infrastructure research funding over over um, the last twenty years or so that that may also explain. Um, some of those differences but really the next step is to get some more numbers um, so we're we're aiming to to go out and, and do a, a macro view of New Zealand um, so if we go to the next slide so we sort of I guess launched this as a um, as a discussion piece at a workshop um, in e-research uh, earlier in this year to sort of get have that conversation of just do people think this is um, a worthwhile thing to do really um, and there was positive feedback because everyone thought they should be able to answer these questions, uh, even if they perhaps didn't quite know why they, you know, can't, but we're not sure why they, they seem important questions to be able to answer. Um, within that and within our first uh, sort of levels of conversation of uh, with our three institutes trying to answer those questions, uh, we also want to slightly review and tweak the questions. Um, and I'll give you an example of, of our thinking here. So if we just go to the next slide. Um, so one of our, I guess one of our questions was around um, volume of unique data that has Maori kaitiaki tanga. Um, and I guess the first question is, is that is that the right question? Um, when we had initial discussions, there was confusion between um, governance that was in place and governance that probably should be, or, or if data was treated as sensitive, does that, does, is that equivalent? And, and I think, you know, it's easy to say it's not equivalent, but then, then what is it? Um, and I think the other big question we had is um, how do we get to a place where we know, where we sort of define a baseline or um, what, what our target is? Because I think there's, uh, 
an assumption, I guess, that we're making at the moment that 100% of the research data um, within New Zealand is probably not going to have Maori kaitiakitanga over it. However, if that's the case, then how do we work out how much data should um, should have that guardianship in place, should have that sovereignty? Um, and so that's that's obviously a, um, a question of, of how do we get both parts of the answer um, so that we can have a measure of, of sort of, I guess, how good um, we're doing in that case. Um, and I think really we need to start with having that much broader discussion with our mana whenua um, in order to um, check that we're coming from the right perspective uh, when we ask this question. So I think if we go to the next slide, which is uh, really just a call out um, to join us for the macro view. Um, if, if you haven't been involved and, and you think this is interesting, um, we uh, either reach out to my, myself or Ireland, depending on which country you're in, um, and because and, we're looking sort of to, to have a repeat of, of doing this um, to get some more numbers. Um, and I'll pass over to Eileen to talk about green and pink space. Thanks, Claire. Yes, yeah, so hopefully we have some added nice numbers for e-research uh, this year, so we're hoping to get something in there. Uh, so as Claire, uh, Claire mentioned, so we're going to just one more idea that we want to kind of throw at you guys. Um, it's quite important. It's called the green and pink space. And so the macro view is starting to help us. It, it's a tool to help us kind of imagine the challenges and to explain why institutions and research organizations feel the challenges that they do and experience what they experience. Um, and so it's enabling us to better understand the Australian and New Zealand research ecosystem. And so arising from that the macro view and the conversations that we've had is the green and pink space. So the original RDCC macro view and then through the interactions with the research organizations um, last year provided us a demonstration that there were certain characteristics that a research organization would progress through in terms of their uh, storage growth. So uh, you can see here in the moving from the bottom left to the top right, that research organizations will go through a phase of getting to scale. And at this point in time, centralization of research services is important, support services, and particularly in the storage, um, in the, in the storage facilities, organizations will try to bring everything together. And so in that period of time, they will have a rapid uh, period of growth. And that's what we've called the getting to scale stage. So uh, there's the New Zealand graph and also there's the original Monash graph we've kicked off this conversation. So between the periods of 2009 and about 2017 is where we experienced that. After that period of growth, there is an eventual kind of operating at scale uh, phase that organize, research organizations will experience. And in this this phase is where a lot of the research organizations we theorize are at at the moment, where they're grappling with the challenges of business management and effectively managing their obligations to for research data and research content um, as an organization. And so in, in this kind of green space area, uh, potentially progressing into deeper green, uh, the operating at scale really means trying to balance uh, your business your business management obligations against your research obligations. Um, and that whole culture is defined by the organizations themselves. Um, but in addition to that, there's a separate space, which is this pink space, which is where uh, research organizations, uh, which represent and focus on research communities, research data, um, and their obligations are really to research data themselves emerge. And, and so this, this separate group and in this pink space, there are very different obligations and focuses for organizations here as opposed to in the green space. And so the culture of this pink space is defined by dis research disciplines, research specific communities and their practices and principles such as FAIR. And so if we look at this together, so in the green space, this is really the demonstration that institutions are the primary location of research data and content. And the macro view is showing us that. And then the pink space represents that data ambitions and the discipline specific kind of sensitivities that we have to have. And so the question is, well, how do we interact in the green space as research organizations with the pink space, ensuring that we can uphold um, and support our research community obligations as well? Uh, so this is just an interesting idea that we're we're starting to emerge and we're trying to we're starting to see in the numbers of the macro view. Um, Claire, did you want to talk about your experience uh, with the green and pink um, in New Zealand? Yeah, thank you. So I think um, just I, I guess a couple of observations that we've made, um, and I'd be keen to I guess 
um, hear, hear if other people would, would agree with these observations or not. But I think um, in Aotearoa for the green space, we see institutional, institutional re repositories um, serving for compliance, um, but end up causing data to be sort of siloed and potentially um, fragmented without the uh, findability or um, domain expertise for metadata to be um, kept with them and ensure fairness. Um, and really, of course, this is because uh, these repositories have to serve uh, all domains. So you can't possibly get sort of specific metadata. Um, and so as an archive, it's not really useful for reuse. Um, it has to be kind of moved to the pink space. So I think we've got some um, some pink space areas um, in terms of um, kind of domain specific solutions for so the na nationally significant collections. Um, we're seeing a few new sort of repositories such as AGDR. Um, and then of course we feed a lot of data into international repositories as well. And I think here they're successful from a sort of a, a fair um, perspective because you've got community driven standards that sort of help to align that mess data. Um, but I think the other thing about the pink space is that it's characterized as being a place that only research output lives. And so all our in-use data, all our sort of actively being used for research now data has to live in the green, um, which is sort of an, I guess, an interesting dynamic because I think there's some characteristics of data that regardless of whether they're in green or pink, um, they exist. So, so for example, I guess, um, Maori data sovereignty um, would, be some, would be a characteristic of, it, of data where, wherever it exists. However, it's only an attribute of pink data currently or, or it, data in the, in the pink, pink area. Um, so I think there's a, there's a question of how we can change this um, because we still need that sovereignty even if data is in the green space, I think. Um, and I'm sure there's other characteristics that this, this sort of applies to as well. Um, and I think the final thing was just sort of a, a brief discussion that was um, part of a conference a few weeks ago in terms of the, the, the manual cost of curating the green to bring it into pink um, is never going to work. That's, it's, it's impossibly high. Um, but there's a sort of, a, I guess, an open question of whether um, AI machine learning techniques could help do that curation. And um, I think there's a few overseas examples of this happening, although interestingly enough, it's still in the pink space area. So it's to make the pink space, you know, even, even higher levels of metadata. Um, but I think there's the, the open question of could we, could we apply that to some of the green space um, data? So I think that's I think that's all I wanted to mention. Um, and then finally, just uh, a thank you uh, both to the wider team and the institutes that have helped uh, give us this data, um, and to our audience for listening today. So we're happy to take questions.